Torque is the rotational analog to force. And here's the definition we've been using for the magnitude of the torque. It's RF sine theta, where R is the distance from the axis of rotation that the force is applied. Theta is the angle that that force makes with the line connecting it to the axis of rotation. Let's look for a second at Newton's second law, F equals MA. We know the rotational equivalent of A is alpha. The rotational equivalent of F force is torque. Do you think there might be a rotational analog of mass? Well, Newton's second law has been applied to point particles that don't rotate. We now want to take an extended rigid body that does right rotate. We'll start with the force on one small piece of the body. So for example, if you have a shape like this and it's rotating about a point here, we're going to take a little tiny piece, a little tiny piece of that surface of that body. And we're going to call that M sub I. And we want to find the force on M sub I. So that'll be F sub I and it will be accelerating. This thing will be rotating. The linear acceleration is A sub I and then we substitute in the angular acceleration where a sub i equals r sub i alpha and r sub i is going to be this distance here the distance between this little piece of mass and the axis of rotation let's assume that the force is applied perpendicular to that line that connects the small piece of mass to the axis of rotation. That will give us sine theta equals 1. So we now have torque on any little piece is going to torque I equals Ri Fi. We know what Fi is from the previous slide, Mi R sub I alpha. And then you multiply Ri times Ri and you get Ri squared. So we have for that little piece of mass the torque on that little piece due to the rotation. Let's sum up all those little pieces. So the sum of all the little pieces is the sum of mi ri squared. And look, we pulled alpha out of the summation. How come? What enables us to do that? I'll open this box here in a second. So if you want to pause it and talk about it. OK, let's open it up. Alpha is constant for all points on the rigid object, just like omega is. Again, one of the values of using this approach to rotational motion. Things are constant wherever you are on the object and they can be pulled out of summations. They can be factored out. This now looks very similar to Newton's second law of motion, where of course we have the sum of the forces equals ma. A has been replaced by alpha the sum of the forces has been replaced by sum of the torque. But instead of mass, we have this guy here, the sum of mr squared. This is a new concept. It is called the moment of inertia. The moment of inertia of an object, I, is equal to the sum of all the little pieces of mass that make up that object times their distance from the rotation axis squared. So you can see this is going to be very heavily dependent on how the object is shaped. Objects further away from the middle will contribute more to the moment of inertia. So given that, we know that the mass of a given rigid object is always constant. Can the same be said for the moment of inertia? No. It depends on the configuration of the rigid object and where its axis of rotation is located. We'll draw a picture here in a second. Here we now have Newton's second law for rotational motion. The sum of the torques on an object equals I times alpha, where I is the summation of all these little masses that make up the object. Now we have a whole paragraph here telling us what we're talking about. If we have more of the little pieces of the rotating object are located further away. So we're going to take a couple examples here. Let's see. We're going to take a sphere. Let's say this is solid. And then we'll take the exact same shape with the same radius and the same mass and put all the mass outside, kind of like a hoop. That's a horrible circle, but pretend it's a circle. In this case, 
more of the mass is further away from the center. There's no mass in the center here. This is a distance r. Over here, you've got some of the mass out at the side, but most of it's in the middle. So which would have the greater moment of inertia? Well, let's look at this sentence. More of the little pieces of the rotating object are located further away from the axis of rotation. So here's your axis of rotation here. Here it is right in the middle here. This guy clearly has more little pieces further away. So its moment of inertia will be greater than this object, which has the same mass, because it has more of the mass closer in, closer to the axis of rotation. This shape will have a higher moment of inertia. This is a slide that shows various moments of inertia for common objects. All the objects have the exact same mass, but different shapes and different axes of rotation. Take a look at these to see how and why the moments of inertia change, and please discuss with your class, or if you're looking at this at home, discuss with yourself. The previous page, we drew a sphere, I drew a very poor sphere, but the moment of inertia, when you do the math, would come out to be 2 fifths mr squared. And basically, you use integral calculus to figure that out, and we'll, we'll do that in APC. The hoop, or the shell, has a moment of inertia of mr squared. That's greater than 2 fifths mr squared. More of the mass is further away from this axis of rotation. Another thing we can do is take the exact same shape. Here we have a long, thin rod. Here we have a long, thin rod again. We rotate this guy about the middle, has a moment of inertia of 1 12th ml squared, where l is the length of the rod, in this case, if you revolve it, rotate it about the end, it has a moment of inertia of one-third ml squared, which is greater. Notice, whenever we compare two things, the same object with a different rotation point, they have the same mass and they have the exact same length. Mass is defined as the resistance of an object to accelerate due to an applied force. The moment of inertia is a measure of an object's resistance to angular acceleration due to an applied torque. Basically, we just replaced accelerate with angular acceleration and force with torque. The greater the moment of inertia of an object, the less it will accelerate due to the applied torque, just like mass and force. So here's a quick problem. The same torque is applied to a solid cylinder and a sphere, each with the same mass and radius. Which object will have a greater angular acceleration? You can go back a slide to find out their moments of inertia. Since the solid sphere has a smaller moment of inertia, it will have a greater angular acceleration. The angular acceleration can be different for the exact same object if a different axis of rotation is chosen. If you want to rotate from rest a long thin rod, where should you hold the rod to make it easier to rotate? You can actually do a quick experiment on this. Get a plastic ruler and tape maybe five, six pennies right in the middle just to put some mass on the object and try rotating it in the middle and try rotating it from the end. You don't exactly have a long, thin rod at this point, but it, it, it approximates it. So take a second either to do the experiment or think about it. Feel free to use the moment of inertia table to help you answer this question. You should hold the rod in the middle. By rotating it about that axis of rotation, the rod has a smaller moment of inertia. So for a given torque, it will have a greater angular acceleration. It will be easier to rotate. So the exact same object, depending on where you hold it, a different uh, angular acceleration will result depending on where you're holding it.